Oh, good morning. Uh, so many people got to bed before midnight last night. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> One? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> You'll understand in a few minutes that I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so I must say I'm a little bit bleary-eyed, but it was an exciting evening. Um, uh, I've always been a kind of real uh, fan of elections, even though in my kind of peculiar history, I've never been able to vote for the political party that's ever governed me. Um, um, even though I grew up in you know, Western democratic societies, I grew up in Northern Ireland where the two main political parties, the Labour and Conservative Party, did not organize there. So if you were a resident of that place, you could not vote for either of the two parties. And of course, since coming to the United States, because I'm not yet an American citizen, I cannot vote in uh, elections, so I'm a kind of voyeur of elections. Um, uh, but um, and last night was a really uh, uh, fun evening. Anyway, good morning. I'm, I'm uh, David Hempton, the new dean of the, D the Divinity School, and just welcome to uh, Harvard Divinity School. Thanks for making it. It's a cold and Irish-looking day, um, so I appreciate the effort you've made to be here. Um, uh, so thanks for your interest in, in HDS, um, um, and um, thanks for coming to find out more about who we are, how we can help you fulfill your aspirations. So I encourage you to make the best possible use of the time you have with us uh, uh, today. Uh, we've got panel presentations, conversations with faculty, staff, and students. <clears throat> um, these are great resources to get to know the school and its programs. You will hear uh, from the faculty about the degree programs and from students and staff about student life and services available at HDS to support our students. Um, one of the really nice things that happened a couple of weeks ago as we um, um, went through our decennial uh, Association of Theological Schools accreditation, which is how complementary um, that external evaluation group was of our student services in particular. So you'll be in great hands today. This afternoon, you'll have the chance to visit the Center for the Study of World Religion, learn about ministry preparation, um, and our directors of admissions and financial aid will be on site to speak more about the application process and the huge amount of goodies we can offer you, uh, allegedly. <laughs> so, um, so why Harvard and why Harvard Divinity School? Why would you want to come here? Um, um, so here are my 10 uh, reasons uh, why you might like to consider uh, joining us. And these will only take about half an hour each, so you'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine by mid-afternoon. Uh, um, so the first is you would be coming, I think, to um, America's oldest university and really one of the great universities in the world. Um, uh, Harvard repeatedly ranks either one or one or two in all the surveys of the top universities in the world. It kind of oscillates a little bit with the other Cambridge in England um, in some of these polls. But it is a great institution. It's an extraordinary place. The Divinity School not only has its own rich history and traditions coming up to our 200th uh, anniversary, but we're situated in a university city of 10 schools and a major research institute. There's always something happening here. It really is a remarkable place uh, to, uh, to be, a uh, great privilege to be here, either as a, a, a student or as a faculty member or, or as a, a staff member. The second thing is that you will have access to one of the world's great library systems, um, uh, 17 million volumes and counting. Um, now, some of you will get through that number in your first semester and will be um, <laughs> eager for more, but um, um, I'm joking, <laughs> honestly. Um, uh, but it is a remarkable resource, I think, uh, certainly as a scholar coming in here and as a teacher. One of the things I really appreciated is when you set up research projects for students to do, that the library resources are really there to support it. Um, so the excuses or reasons that I used to hear in previous academic appointments of, uh, you know, we just couldn't get the book, so we just couldn't find enough resources, that just doesn't happen here. Um, if you haven't found the resources, you just haven't looked hard enough because they're here. Um, so it is a remarkable um, privilege to have access to that system. Uh, thirdly, you will come to an already diverse and eclectic place and we would love it to be even more diverse uh, and eclectic. 
So come and bring your talents and unique abilities to our community. We, we want it to be a rich and diverse uh, group of people. Fourthly, you will come to a place that takes religious pluralism seriously in a world that seriously needs it. Um, and as someone who comes from Belfast and Northern Ireland who grew up there in the, in the midst of, of the euphemistically called troubles in the 1970s, um, this is something I believe very uh, passionately about. So here we have at least three distinguished faculty members with ex expertise in, um, in at least five of the world's great religious traditions. Uh, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism, and many others with expertise in other religious traditions as well. America's world-famous religious pluralism project was started at Harvard and continues to thrive here um, uh, under the leadership of one of our faculty members. Fifthly, you will come to a place with a, a distinguished faculty who are at the forefront of their subjects and disciplines. Um, most recently, our most recent appointment is a new professor in Islamic studies uh, who specializes in sub-Saharan Africa and on Muslim migratory communities in Europe and North America, uh, Usman Khan, who will join us in January 1st. We have three active searches in place for next year in American religious history and in ministry studies, and we will have another three searches in place for the year after, so we're constantly on the lookout for strengthening our faculty and uh, growing our expertise. Sixthly, you will enter a culture in which successful students are self-guided, self-directed, um, um, and take responsibility for your own uh, studies and careers. <clears throat> so come and be prepared to knock on doors, badger your professors relentlessly, um, and prepare seriously <clears throat> for what you want to do next. It is a place where people will want to talk to you. Seventh, whatever the program you choose, we have a very strong record of placing our students, whether in field ed programs in the United States and beyond, or in the top doctoral programs in this country, if that's where you're uh, bound for. Eighth, HDS has a vigorous alumni network. Check out the recent Divinity Dialogues event at, at, at HDS, in which Gloria White Hammond spoke of her career as an HDS student and her remarkable work in the Sudan, starting schools and working against trafficking of girls and young women in Sudan and Darfur. It's a spectacular talk of someone who gained her um, uh, uh, intellectual formation and care about the world here and has uh, really done a magnificent job in, in, in promoting that. Ninth, HDS is committed to understand how religion plays out in the wider world. Of all the 10 graduate schools at Harvard, I learned recently from the, uh, Harvard had this global advisory council on how Harvard could uh, have a greater impact on the wider world. And in that, there was a, pack, a packet of information about the 10 schools, the graduate schools at Harvard. We have the highest percentage of courses in the Divinity School that touch on international themes and issues higher than the law school, higher than the business school, higher than the medical school, uh, which is a remarkable uh, fact, I think. Finally, I think, uh, and perhaps most important of all, you'd be coming to a school with a thriving intellectual culture and a commitment to high-level service. Highlights of this semester alone include a set, of a set of seminars on and a visiting lecture from America's only living Nobel laureate in, in literature, Toni Morrison. We've had a remarkable lecture by the founder of America's Interfaith Youth Corps, Ibu Patel, who's one of the most, I think, impressive young men in the country, and one of uh, President Obama's uh, advisors on interfaith issues, just a terrific person. We've had a set of events on the presidential election from some of America's leading exper experts on the interface between religion and politics and many, many other things uh, besides. So there's always something exciting and interesting going on um, in this community and in wider Harvard. Um, and you're also coming to a city, Cambridge, Boston, two cities, um, um, with a, a remarkable intellectual culture itself, just so many universities. And through the Boston Theological Institute, you will get to um, uh, have connections with some of those universities, if you so wish. Um, 
while I was teaching at BU, I often taught Harvard students or Boston College students or, um, or students from some of the other BTI affiliates. So it's a great theological and religious studies city, um, uh, quite apart from a great university city um, in Harvard itself. So here are 10 reasons. Um, if you do come to Boston, that sports teams will break your heart. Um, <laughs> Um, but that's part of the deal. Um, so I hope you do decide to apply to us. We would love to have you bring your uh, unique and special gifts to HDS and thereby further enrich our uh, already, I think, very special community. So I think I can take a few questions now, though as new dean I won't be able to answer them. <laughs> but I certainly will be able to rechannel them to people who will be able to answer them. And of course, I'll meet up with um, uh, many of you over lunch as well later today, and, and some of you uh, uh, later in the evening as well. So, um. I'd first like to say that you have an excellent voice for a dean of a, of a school. <laughs> I love your voice. Um, secondly, what was the first thing about Harvard that you found pleasantly surprising when you got here? Uh, pleasantly surprised when I got here? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Pleasantly surprising. Um, I think a couple, well, you know, one of the great pleasant surprises is the library system. I mean, it just blows you away. And I was just working on a project on um, the rise of early modern uh, Christianity and wanted to make it a global story um, and therefore uh, needed resources from China, Latin America, Africa, um, Russia, um, Central Asia. Just Really amazing. I don't think there's a single thing I had to travel to get that I needed. So one of the great surprises is just that. Another, I think, is just the way, uh, if you can make it work, how extraordinary this institution is. Um, I think I had no idea of its reach, its size, its other uh, schools, um, its the extent of its campus. Um, uh, so, and really, I think also many of the good things that it's involved in, and you have this kind of image of Harvard become from outside, rather elitist, uncaring, uh, stuffy uh, kind of place. And I really was surprised at how untrue that was. I mean, we have just a wonderful president, Drew Fowles, who is an extraordinary leader of the institution, and uh, a set of really terrific deans who care about the world order. Um, you know, the dean of the Kennedy School goes up every day and looks at a sign saying how to make the world a better place. That's what makes him do it. Um, nothing else is that he wants to be a dean, believe me. <laughs> 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 um, so, so those would be some things I would say. I mean, it is, if you love universities and you love intellectual culture and you love the idea of serving uh, the world from a position of knowledge and information. It doesn't really come much better than Harvard, really, in my experience as an academic across a, a couple of continents and many different institutions. Yeah? How did your experiences growing up in Belfast lead you to become a professor of theological studies and dean of practice? Ah, well, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I went up to Queen's University in Belfast as an undergraduate in 1970, and um, the next, so it's a four-year degree, 70 to 74. They were the four worst years of violence in Northern Ireland, and as a sequence in terms of the number of people killed and injured, uh, well over a thousand people killed in those years, and really quite a small province. So. Um, um, and also I'd gone up there uh, from a very segregated uh, educational system. Protestant and Catholic kids are educated separately. But they meet at Queen. You know, for the first time you meet people from, quote, the other tradition. Um, so I became really tremendously interested in religion and political culture. You know, how does it work? Um, what are the intersections, connections? It almost comes intravenously in Belfast, religion and political culture. Um, and um, so what I wanted to do graduate work, I decided to work on um, uh, Protestant anti-Catholicism. Yeah, that's what I got interested in at the start. 
Um, so, I, I, and I guess from there, it, it, it just kind of moved its way along. But that sense of trying to understand how religion, both the good, the bad, and the ugly of religion, and there was a lot of all of those on display in Belfast, actually. Um, so understanding what that good, bad, and the ugly looked like, how to think about it better, how to make a contribution to it. So it was partly, I guess, like many scholars, it was partly a self-exploration and a community exploration, and then it began to sp spread out from there. I came to the United States, and uh, I think I could only describe it as a midlife crisis. Because <laughs> uh, I was quite well settled and happy in an academic job back in, 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 um, uh, in Ireland, and just got invited to come to Boston University for a variety of reasons, and took the risk, and came, and, and enjoyed it very much, and then sailed across the river. Uh, five years ago. Uh, so, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Based on uh, what you just said about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, um, of your studies, what you were interested in, I come from the South, from yeah. the United States, North Carolina. I've gone through a lot of what I, I believe is, is is a similar spiritual journey. And I'm just curious as to, as your position as a dean, what do you see as the good and the bad and the ugly that needs to be addressed in wake of our recent election and, and the divide that we still have in this country in religion? And what is Harvard's role and purpose, do you think, for the next few years in, in, in bridging that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, um, I think in an audience like this, people will have different um, uh, cultural, political perceptions about, you know, what the problems are in, in our country or, or how to think about them. But one thing I know for sure, both from my background in Ireland and my time spent in the United States, and that is just a absolute priority of increasing religious literacy, mutual respect, tolerance. Um, um, you, you know, I, I do think that education, uh, I mean, it was the route for me from a working class background into something, into a place like this. And I, I just feel that the more we understand about other religious traditions, um, uh, I mean, in Ibu Patel's uh, recent book, um, um, which is really a good read. He talks about um, greater literacy, uh, greater sites for encounter, so that uh, people uh, can see other people. I mean, this Robert Putnam has made the same point in his recent book, American Grace, that the more we meet people of different religious traditions, the more difficult it is to sustain hostilities and misconceptions. So literacy, sites of meeting, greater knowledge, and greater respect and tolerance. These are just great things. And I think that in the world order uh, that I see, I mean, when I was in Northern Ireland, actually, and left it uh, as a young person to go and study elsewhere, I thought I was living in one of the world's last great religious conflicts, a, a kind of vestigial remain of the Protestant Reformation, Europe's last Protestant Catholic frontier. Uh, the, the 30 years of uh, wars of religion um, uh, postponed for 300 years. I, I thought I was looking at the last of something. Um, I think little did I know that I was not looking at the last. I was looking um, at a pattern that emerged in the Balkans and the old Yugoslavia in the Middle East um, and then with 9-11 and all that's unfolded since then. So. I think these are really important times to be thinking about religion, um, important times to get people together from diverse traditions to talk and think about them without giving up one's tradition. Um, uh, but um, uh, So those would be things that I think are really significant. How it plays out politically and, and so on, I mean, I've obviously got personal views about all of these things. I've written a lot about political culture and my life and how it works, but that would probably wait for a more 
you know, a, a more interactive seminar discussion rather than me parading my views to you. And, uh, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the uh, yeah in the early row and then the and then the back one. Yeah. Um, well, first I want to commend definitely the era of mutual respect that you're creating here at Harvard. But I'm curious, um, to what extent do you go beyond just mutual respect for various religions and um, facilitate and promote conversations that transcend religions and begin a conversation of humans' inherent spiritual desires? So, between religions, does that conversation exist, and how, how, how are you creating it? Well, um, uh, I mean, part of it exists in the, in the investment we've made in our faculty, um, uh, which has changed dramatically in the past decade, from a primarily um, um, uh, Christian-oriented divinity school to a much more multi-faith tradition. Um, part of it exists in the day-to-day -day encounters of our students. Uh, we want to build up an eclectic and diverse student body so that these conversations can happen one-on-one um, uh, uh, -on -one or on, in groups. We do it in our curriculum with, with what I mentioned earlier, just an extraordinary range of, of uh, courses on uh, and other traditions. Um, we do it through things like the Pluralism Project and schemes that students can get involved in. Um, there are many other ways. I think uh, you know. I think um, uh, uh, an entering class with, with you know, people with uh, interests, abilities, and initiative. Um, Harvard's a great place to to, to, to have a public voice from. Um, you know, since becoming dean, I've gone to all sorts of interesting places. You know, from presidential briefings on faith-based initiatives to. Um, a large New York conference on promoting religious literacy in the United States. And the, <clears throat> the things that I've discovered there is just the wide re reach of this university. <clears throat> a lot of interns and, and, um, and uh, directors of organizations uh, have Harvard roots, uh, often divinity school, sometimes other, you know, business school or law school. So, um, um, so those would be some ways. I mean, <clears throat> we also have you know, uh, a quite eclectic range of, of faith traditions that host uh, their own um, uh, services here, uh, uh, noon time services on Wednesdays. Um, but really, all ideas on this are welcome. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, uh, so this is something I'd love to see grow and develop. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, so thank you. And then the do we have time for one more? One more, yeah. You yeah. get the, this is better be good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous about it. I'll <laughs> see what I can do. Um, aside from, um, you know, a sort of political engagement toward religious pluralism or perhaps um, a sort of spiritual dialogue, um, I, I guess my question is what role um, does a philosophical approach? play, um, you know, when we talk about coming to terms with other faiths or encountering the other, so to speak, um, and uh, I, I, I guess within dialogue, what is the role of uh, philosophical sure. uh, thought, uh, particularly here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, a great, that's a great question. <clears throat> I think what I'd say is, I mean, obviously a lot of my own background, my own academic interests have been on um, religion and political culture just happens to be something I've worked on um, that I've been interested in. But I really believe this work has to be done uh, in a multidisciplinary way. Um, uh, so um, philosophy, certainly, uh, anthropology, um, literature, um, uh, uh, you know, a whole range of, of, of possibilities uh, there. Um, so. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not a trained philosopher, although I do read some philosophy, you know, to help me go to sleep and things. No, so I'm really interested in those uh, questions. Um, um, uh, we have. Uh, uh, some distinguished philosophers, both in the Divinity School and um, in uh, F. 
FAS, Library of Arts and Sciences. Um, it's an area that I think we'd like to strengthen uh, going forward. Um, so I think the main answer to your question would be that um, I don't want to give the impression that all we do here is some kind of interfaith or political cultural interaction. That, that out of the 45 or so uh, professors and scholars we have here, people are experts in a great range of things um, um, uh, and all very committed to their particular uh, uh, disciplines and rules of engagement. So one of the nice things about the Divinity School, as opposed to a, an institution that I chaired before, which was a large history department where we had about 30 to 40 historians, I mean, here we have really a terrifically eclectic disciplinary range of scholars who work here. And that, I think, is one of the most exciting things about it. So we do meet as faculty for faculty lunches and talk about our work, including these very different approaches. So, um, uh, so that kind of different kind of disciplinary way to end, I'm definitely a, a supporter of. Um, but I need to learn more philosophy. Uh, come and teach me. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you.